everybody. I'm Peter Trippi. I'm editor-in-chief of Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine in New York. Uh, delighted to be gathering with kindred spirits yet again. Uh, this is uh, one of the fun aspects of my job is to connect with artists and dealers and educators in the art world to talk about issues of common concern. I'm delighted to be joined yet again today by Katie Whipple, uh, a great artist based in New York. There she is waving. Hi, Katie. Hi, Peter. Great to be with you. We're having fun with this, aren't we? This yeah, is our I'm having shared a blast. journey. Yeah, it's been great. What a what a joyful thing to look forward to during the long days of quarantine. <laughs> These are long days, absolutely. Uh, we're going to lighten them up a bit, I think. Um, basically, uh, just to remind everyone that we thought um, it's always good to connect with colleagues uh, and find out what's going on with them, but especially in this very strange season. Uh, it's wise to hear what's on people's minds uh, when it comes to um, issues of uh, not just personal concern, but shared concern. And we'll talk more about that shortly. Uh, let me begin just by introducing myself, and then Katie will say a few words about herself, and we'll go around the table uh, and hear from the others. Uh, I'm Peter Trippi, as I mentioned before. I edit the magazine Fine Art Connoisseur. I'm also an independent curator of exhibitions, uh, primarily to do with 19th century European art. Katie. I'm Katie Whipple. I am a painter, mostly of flowers. You can see behind me, I'm in my studio. I also uh, teach at the Grand Central Atelier as well as chair the development committee there. Great, Zoe. Hi, uh, my name is Zoe Dufour. I am a primarily figurative sculptor and I studied in New York at Grand Central Atelier. I teach there occasionally, and right now I'm based in Northern California. Great, welcome. Cesar. Hi everyone, um, I am Cesar Mesa, um, I'm from Mexico. Um, I'm a painter who most, who most of the time works with figurative work and drawing and painting primarily. Uh, I'm also a student, um, I've been a part-time student at Grand Central Atelier in New York City for um, maybe about two years now, so yeah, um, I'm still um, forming myself, but um, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Glad you're here. And finally, but not, la not least but not last, is Betty. Hi, Betty Standish, I'm Program Director at Weathersfield Academy for the Arts in Weathersfield, Connecticut. We're halfway between Boston and New York, and uh, we have uh, a wonderful little facility that um, promotes the classical arts. And we've had Katie teach a workshop with us and many other fine um, artists from New York, Boston, and around the country. So that's a short of it. Welcome. Thank we'll you. hear more about your activities soon. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, uh, I just want to remind everyone of some of the key questions that we had posed to the panelists before they gathered with us here. Uh, I'm just going to review them, and we can keep these in mind as we move through the hour. How are things going for you and your colleagues during the pandemic? Please provide specific examples of some frustrations and successes. What do you see on the horizon for you, your activities, and the field of contemporary realism next month, three months from now, and next year? And finally, how can the people watching this program make a difference to that future now? We mean not only donations to worthy nonprofits, but also direct support of what you do and what your colleagues do. So uh, this is very much rooted in our times. Uh, this conversation would be very different in flavor six months ago. Uh, and I wanna thank Katie for making the suggestion that we pull this together it, pretty quickly. You know, we, we've done it pretty fast and I appreciate all of you jumping right in so that we could share ideas. So, um, Dale, who's our wonderful technician from Streamline Publishing, uh, is on the call, and I think that he is going to now pop up the slide deck, uh, which we've all looked at. There it goes. That's great. We begin with Zoe's uh, slides, and she'll tell us a bit more about what we're seeing here. Take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Oh, you can move to the next slide. Uh, this is Rubiaceae. It was a piece I made for a show that Katie curated, Floral Legion. Uh, and it was 
also kind of a test piece for some ceramic techniques that I've started learning recently. And it's the largest scale ceramic piece I've made to date. And it gave me an opportunity to play with a lot of things that are a little bit more difficult when I was working in clay, but would have to mold and cast into a different material. So when I'm working with a uh, ceramic as the end medium, I get to play a lot more with delicate textures and sort of fineness, thinness of um, thinness of certain sculpture that just wouldn't be possible or wouldn't survive a molding process. And so there's something really gratifying to me about the ceramic sculpture where you're really sculpting your end result, where normally it goes through so many mutations as you cast the piece, you sort of, it feels to me normally going through the casting process, like I'm ending up with a different piece than I sculpted, which is honestly a little emotionally difficult. Um, but the ceramic process is some, one that I, I find I prefer now. And I've been sort of playing with connecting, I guess, human likeness with natural elements and in a really basic way, just trying to look for connection to nature, which I feel like we've, you know, sort of been removed from in a broad sense uh, in general society. Um, you can go to the next slide now. This is a life-size portrait, and it was done with Stan Prokopenko, who runs a, like a, I don't know, skill-based, like, anatomy, drawing, painting, figurative, uh, sort of online school uh, now. It's sort of gone through mutations. He has a really great YouTube page that I know a lot of representational artists use heavily. He's uh, a great resource and I feel really lucky to have been able to work with him. But this is created during a tutorial I filmed with him. And then um, it, I cast it into HydroCal and is one of my few pieces I've actually finished that's not ceramic. And so it's one that I like to show. Um, get, go to the next slide. This is another ceramic experiment. So this is in porcelain and I was just curious about finishing porcelain. It's one of the finest clays you can use and if you work with it well you can actually get it so thin it can be translucent and just the surface that's possible with porcelain is really unique and so it's a clay that I'd like to play with more but it's also um, it's really temperamental and it's one of the hardest materials I've worked with before and so I don't <laughs> when the next time is, I'll, I'll, I'll work in it again, but I do love the finished look. Yeah, you go to the next slide. This is a painting by a friend, Kevin Mueller. His work, I just think, is so beautiful. He has this really moody, atmospheric quality in a lot of his paintings that I just find incredibly compelling. Uh, this is a painting of his partner, Maisie, and um, it's just a gorgeous piece. And then we could go to the following side. Uh, this is a painting by another friend, Emily Lee. This was done in her backyard, I believe, while she was in quarantine. And she's in Southern California, and her garden is just amazing. <laughs> and it's been really nice. She has a great uh, social media presence. It's been really nice to be able to follow along with her on her process of painting these and just sort of like a nice virtual escape from, you know, where I am every day to be taken along with her, her process and see her space. Right. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you. That's great, Zoe. I appreciate that. Over to Cesar. Okay, um, let's, let's start with the first slide. Okay, so this, this painting, um, it's currently on the easel, actually. Uh, I'm working from life, so I, I managed to, to have a model holding for me for this uh, painting during these difficult times. Uh, it was, um, let's say that it was a little bit delicate to, to bring the subject of um, working from life because 
uh, nowadays we all have to be very careful with um, these activities, especially this one um, that involves uh, two, two persons in the same studio at the same time and working together. But um, fortunately, there are um, a lot of uh, ways to, to make that happen. And one of the, the aspects of that is just to, to remain um, very patient with the other. Uh, in this case, uh, for me, towards the model, like uh, listening to her and what are um, her concerns. Um, also, uh, bringing a very safe environment for her and other models that I'm currently working with. So um, this painting in particular, uh, it, I'm trying to, to describe not only, and I'm, I'm not gonna try to define the technical aspects of it um, just right now, but um, often I'm thinking about the importance of um, contemplation and also the awe uh, that we get when we experience things directly when we are in nature, and that means outdoors. Um, but, but also trying to combine those two subjects, uh, the, the figure and, and also like a kind of a, a conception of, of nature, it's, um, it's nothing new, but it's also um, one of the most um, difficult things to, to manage, and that, that is to, for an instance, um, to bring it to a success compositionally, and also trying to, to define some sort of poetry with it. And that's uh, what I'm trying to, to aim with this painting, which um, I have to say, uh, for the composition in the background, the, the landscape, it's uh, from imagination. So I, I have had uh, to, to make some uh, studies, um, obviously trying to be or remain logic with the loss of light and physicality of nature. And it's very complex, but it's also very fun to do it because, um, well, I'm, I'm glad that it's not the first time to do that, but uh, if so, it, it would have been just so exciting uh, because you are, you, you have been in those places in different situations in the, uh, I'm trying to say um, like um, in the forest or in the fields, walking around, uh, et cetera. So you vaguely recognize what you're trying to, to express. So, um, well, right now um, I already did the studies and I'm gonna start working on the piece uh, and to figure it out if it's good or not, like what, I, what I have chosen for the, the composition, which is uh, right behind me. I mean, you can see the, the painting right over there. And uh, I had to wait until the previous layers dried up so I wouldn't like um, mess the figure. This is only the, um, uh, the second layer of color. So I might um, hire the model again for one more time, one more session. And then, uh, but that's gonna be after the, the landscape or the rest of the composition is done. So I can uh, make different changes or, or not. I mean, who knows? Uh, probably I'm gonna scrap off a lot of things because that's one of the things that I like to do. I, uh, I like to um, challenge myself to not feel comfortable all the time when I'm working and to pursue something um, more interesting perhaps uh, or more developed. Uh, well, yeah, um, can we get to the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so this and the next study um, are kind of like, um, okay, it's not a series. First of all, I don't, I, I normally don't work thinking about series because I think that um, evokes uh, an irregularity in my schedule when I'm working or even my philosophy. I don't, I don't like to think that any single painting or drawing is attached to some sort of uh, compiling definition with a different amount of work. But um, in these two cases, um, well, this, this and the, the other study were very fun, um, particularly this one, uh, just because these studies uh, are work from imagination, and I mean all of it. So um, um, initially, uh, well, uh, initially I worked with a model, but I had only like 20 minutes, just one pose, and I did like a very abstract uh, drawing of it. And then after that, I, I as, a, as a game maybe, 
and also trying to find some sort of um, some sort of things to to talk about the observation and the understanding of uh, distractions also because when you have you are in front of a figure you have to remain very concentrated in what you are trying to to do and what you are observing but also um with this study uh, i was practically with only four shapes two blocks of um, dark and light masses and then i had to figure out the, the structure of the figure the tangible um, explanation or representation of the figure and then i also i did a, a bunch of studies in, in drawing and then i, I did a, an a crochet in painting i did everything like a, a cliche uh, on top of the cliche i started doing some um, color studies also um, just to separate the initial idea and trying to understand the, the, the palette that i was gonna be using for the painting. So um, this is a small study. It's uh, about um, um, 15 by 17 or something like that. Um, I vaguely remember, but uh, it, it's it's just um, an opportunity for me to to talk um, about the deeper meaning of nature and how can we um, get an essential harmony between uh, this imaginative um, figure and also something that is uh, brought from life. So for the, the next um, paintings, those are going to be so, so large. I mean, it, probably it's going to be the, the largest, uh, the largest paintings that I've, that I've done so far. So it's going to be uh, maybe I'm thinking because I only bought the panels and uh, I'm preparing them. So I'm, I'm hoping next month uh, starting to work in this. Um, it's going to be bigger than four by six foot, maybe. So it's it's not that big, maybe. Uh, I know there are a lot of artists that work bigger than that. But for me, it's like a good um, challenge. So yeah, um, let's go to the next slide, please. And this is the other study that I was um, telling you about. And also, um, one of the important things that I have to uh, understand and now this is um, a more technical issue is that uh, when I started thinking about this composition in, in the last one I, I was trying to encounter uh, some sort of thoughts that were clear enough to to make me um, portray even uh, a full figure or just like a three-quarter figure and how to even in, interpret that um, on the surface so it was a, a tough decision. And I'm not saying that this exact composition that you are looking at right now, it's gonna be the one that I've been uh, painting like a, in full scale. Um, no, I'm probably gonna change a little, but um, as, a, okay, I, I mentioned that it was an experiment, but it was more than that, because uh, every day that I was working on, on these studies, I understood so much about uh, the complications of just constructing an image and at how this instantly evolves something. And I, I have to be very careful with that because um, first of all, I just like to paint and uh, I don't, sometimes I don't, um, I don't like to be distracted with the, the topic or the language or the, what that painting or drawing is gonna say. I think sometimes, um, and I'm not saying that this is a general situation, but to me, um when i have clear objectives of what i want it allows me to go um much further and also to change the the progressive future of that piece so uh yeah hopefully next month i'm gonna be showing in my um social media and also the page uh, the progress of these paintings let's go for the next last slide please and okay um this is um portrait drawing I did of my mother last year uh, during the summer. Um, to talk about drawing for me is not only to talk about the roots of painting and most of the art disciplines that we know uh, these days, that it consists of moments of profound appreciation and also how, how can, can we be able to understand the nature 
of different people that is in front of us. Obviously, um, it means so much more than that because um, it's my mother and uh, and I love her. But um, it, it's, it was also uh, the second portrait I did of her. But this is maybe the the one that I have liked the most yet. Because um, maybe um, trying to to hold on on a strong um, love for her um, allowed me to also be very specific and yet uh, remain very abstract with the shapes in the drawing. So uh, I I tried to to be a little bit moody, uh, you know, with gray of, of course, um, just to let the expression to become um, fresh and also a little bit of a life. That's one of the goals that we are trying to achieve. Like uh, our works needs to be they need to be breathing and uh, they they have to have a soul. So it means um, more than um, personal uh, feelings uh, from me to my mom, and also like a, a little bit of accomplishment in this drawing. Because I've, uh, I've done a lot of drawings of different people, but in, sometimes when you, when you know the person you are portraying, uh, it involves a lot of uh, experiences that you have had with this person. So, okay, let's go to the next slide. And uh, this is a self-portrait, as you can see, um, and it's also a work that is uh, currently in, in progress. Uh, right now, what you are looking at is, um, well, I'm, I'm trying to, to create some sort of harmony within the the composition, the arrangement of uh, the, um, the objects that I have behind me, what, what those objects or uh, pictures mean to me. It's not only uh, pictures of different uh, old masters, um, it's also some of my sketches that I've done uh, in the past month and last year. And um, also, and very importantly, I think uh, there are two letters that I wrote to myself uh, that are um, in the left corner of the painting, the upper left corner. Um, these letters are reflections and meditations about what I do and why I do it the way I do it, or uh, trying to find some sort of serenity, um, especially during these times, because uh, uh, I started this painting um, maybe a month and a half ago. I started uh, doing the drawing uh, of the self-portrait. Um, and then I, I transferred it to start the painting. So it's, it has been a wild ride, I have to say, because, um, well, the self-appreciation that I have uh, of myself, because uh, first of all, I, I recognize all my mistakes and I think that's what it feels uh, in, or I hope it feels in my work because uh, I like to be mistaken a lot. That's one of the things that makes me grow. And um, I'm not trying to get like the right brush stroke uh, at the first try. Um, if anything, uh, um, I, I mentioned something of scrapping off uh, the surface of the paintings. I did with this particular painting twice that. I mean, I, I scrapped it off. Um, I didn't care about if I had something good on it. Um, trying to find a relationship between the meaning of the painting and also the technicality of it, uh, it needs to have some sort of balance to me. And one of the best things that I, that I experienced with this, and it's not the first time that I experienced this, but um, when you discovered that you are left alone with your own thoughts in a very uh, closed environment and when you are not in contact with other people. That gave me surprisingly um, an attentive uh, appreciation of what I was doing and what I am doing still. So uh, it makes me be more patient. Um, not that I, that I wasn't before. Uh, I consider myself very patient um, and I'm always trying to be more, even more. Um, but but yeah, uh, so with this self-portrait painting, um, I'm just trying to to recognize where I am and where I am this at this moment. So uh, 
like I said, I'm trying to be very honest and sincere with, uh, with what I'm showing. And um, I hope um, I don't mess this painting up later. <laughs> <laughs> but um, okay, so this is me. Um, thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, you've raised lots of interesting ideas. Thank you. Betty, over to you. Hi. Oh. Yes. But we suddenly are on someone's desktop. Oh, okay. That was my desktop. Uh, okay, there we go. Great. All right. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you, Peter and Katie, for inviting me. This is quite an honor. Um, yeah. So um, let's start with um, these are some of our instructors at the academy. Um, oh dear, did I just go? I think I just lost my notes. Here it is. Um, K Katie Engberg, Catherine Engberg, um, began teaching at the Weathersfield Academy for the Arts in the fall of 2016. Um, we needed a portrait and figure drawing instructor at the time, and her work just stood out for us. Katie possesses an admirable way of calmly assuring students of, her, of their own abilities to achieve the process she is teaching. After two years, that two hour ride up to Weathersfield to teach two classes and two hour ride back to Queens was just too much. But I applaud her for doing it for two years. Um, so I encourage her to teach uh, multi day workshops and now she comes up two or three times a year to teach portrait painting. She has at this point a following who loves her. Um, for artists who have a keen ability to teach a room full of eager art beavers. That's what I call them. Workshops can be quite profitable. So Katie pointed me to a show of uh, John Singer Sargent's drawings at the Morgan last year. It was breathtaking um, how he defined facial features and the um, essential period personalities with the quickest of charcoal lines. So now Katie sells her paintings promptly after finishing um, her portraits. Um, whether they're like full portrait oil paintings or these portrait sketches like this one you see in front of you. This painting, by the way, is sold. Uh, she's coming to Weathersfield at the end of July to teach a portrait sketch and oils workshop. And we'll move on to Paul. Next. Paul Batch um, taught landscape painting with us for a season, enjoying a room full of most interesting personalities that make up landscape painters. Paul painted at the University of Art, uh, Hartford's Art School and found his post-degree studies of artists such as George Ennis and Fred Cummings and Edward Siegel very much affected his brushwork. His brushwork is absolutely exquisite. Um, I had originally pegged Paul as a tonalist, but when I saw this high chroma painting, I knew this was the one I had to show you all. Um, maybe this is what a pandemic does to you with the cute kiddos running around the house, but um, it's just wonderful what he did here. Um, he'll be teaching a landscape workshop in September with us. Next. This is Veronique Fournier Wynn, uh, who has taken almost all the drawing and painting classes and workshops with us. She's now a class instructor several times a week. This was paused by the pandemic but she teaches the Bardic drawing class, which is where it all begins. Um, having taken all the co color mixing courses we have offered, uh, she also teaches the beginning oil painting classes, which is mostly in still life. The value of studying master copies is also offered um, to students to begin to understand how the masters accomplish their techniques. Veronique is not afraid of challenges having climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Because she continues uh, drawing barred plates for practice, uh, learning painting methods and styles in the many workshops that we offer. Next. Okay, so this is Mara Safara. Uh, the artwork of Mara refers to our human understanding of the other forms of life and melds the distinct um, uniqueness of each creature with the subtle clues to their personalities. Her art engages in a fantasy world in which color sometimes textures in a quiet humor dominating the art. This Egyptian cat is not what we assume of cat imagery. Um, I think of the happy cat, the lucky hat, cat that goes like this all the time at you. Um, 
but this is this is specific this is referential and has a solid presence which changes as our position to it and the light source changes around it so mara says my artwork focus in focuses on our interactions uh, with the humans on earth and all its beings the objective is to allow the viewer to relate the image in a personal way to be charmed by nature the way i have interpreted mara is a supporter of the academy takes classes and will be teaching again after the pandemic next so this is jeremiah patterson he's awesome this this watercolor has been on our walls for a very long time as an example of still life painting embodying all the principles we want to teach at the academy jeremiah has shown widely um he lives in um, Massachusetts, Stockbridge, I think it is. Um, and he comes down to teach at the University of Hartford's Art School. He has shown across the country internationally. He teaches workshops with us, but does fun things like leading small groups to Italy each summer to paint with his co-conspirator, Fred Wessel. Does anybody know Fred Wessel? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, so they teach landscape painting and watercolor in these lovely environments, but also egg tempera, silver point drawing, and other Renaissance methods and techniques. Most of these techniques are not common anymore as you have, you have to be willing to take on demanding needs of these mediums. For instance, the subtle differences between uh, the teachings in egg tempera by various instructors are valuable as long as you practice both to know which one works best for you. So you take the best from everything that you learned. Um, as far as contemporary realism, Jeremiah was taught this way of painting by his father and his father's father, and he goes back five generations. So this is like practically in his DNA. Next. So the Academy um, reaches those interested in beginning their study in the classical approach. There is a market we find to learning within the six week class format in the studio with a knowledgeable instructor building skill sets until they're ready to take workshops in what I would call master level learning methods. Next. Uh, so we have a call to artists right now for a fine art competition and uh, we, began, we began planning this last fall uh, before realizing the pandemic was to happen and somehow the theme challenge of a sense of place is more poignant now than ever um, and uh, I hear that there's a there's like pandemic art being done, although I haven't seen it. It would be interesting to see what comes in. Um, our original intent was for artists to pay attention to a narrative of a painting. When you examine paintings of the masters, you have to wonder at the specifiers and around the central focus. The learning is, um, the setting is often the additional distinguishers of these paintings. I have a, a mind, a panel discussion with several curators to delve into this. Early re registration for the competition is June 30th, uh, although you can register until August 30th. Then there is another month before the painting is due, hopefully dried and varnished. <laughs> um, when accepted into the show, the paintings will be in a gallery for two weeks, available for public purchase and eligible for $5,000 worth of prizes. Peter will be one of our adjudicators. Our intent is to challenge and support artists in their endeavors, and we hope you will consider this effort. It definitely brings up the level of visual dialogue and public discourse. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's some more details, in fact. Um, the, the, this will all be present on the recording, Betty. So all of this is going to go out with the program, all right? Uh, I think that probably, um, let's linger here for half a minute, Dale, on this screen so that people have it to read. Uh, if the rest of you could unmute, that would be great because we're going to chat now. Thank you. 
That's really helpful. Um, I'm, I'm full of questions, but I'm going to let Katie take a shot first if she wishes. No, no pressure. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. Wow. Uh, what an amazing uh, slideshow we were just treated to and all of your thoughts and insights and wow. Um, gosh, I can't wait for everybody to hear this conversation. Just that part of it is was so great. Um, so yeah, so I just thank you. And um, I, I feel the same way, Peter. I've, I've Feel like we could take this in a million different directions so i'm going to trust you to start us we have off. time yeah uh, <laughs> just th there were a few things that came up that i thought were so interesting because they reflect what's happening right now um i was thinking of caesar's point about depicting nature from the imagination uh now clearly that's what he wanted to do with that particular figure in the landscape it's the first slide he showed us uh but is that going to be in the near term a factor for everyone that they can't necessarily get out to nature because the way of getting there is blocked you know whether through airplanes or not flying or i don't own a car so i have to rent one and that's not easy to do I, i'm just making up those examples um a related question that, that obviously everyone has their way in on this one uh with zoe i was wondering about fabrication you can make all the clay models you want, but is it possible to take the next step in terms of, uh, for example, casting, uh, if the foundry is closed or if it's very difficult to be safe and distanced in such a setting? So I'm putting all that out there for anybody to tackle. Um, right now I am trying to set up a kiln at my house and that's been difficult just because they require a really high amperage. And so, my <laughs> short-term solution is honestly to unplug my dryer and then plug my kiln into the dryer <laughs> outlet. And, <laughs> and <laughs> it's not ideal and it's a really small kiln. It's a smaller than normal kiln that can go off of a 30 amp. I think normally they are on 50 amp circuits. And so I can only produce smaller clay pieces and um, I'm having to go back to molding and casting, which is, is workable where I am. It's just not my preferred process now that I've started doing the ceramic work. And then as far as I know right now, the foundries I've contacted are not operating. So I'm hoping that they will be in the near future. Great. Thank you. Cesar. For me, um, talking about that point that you were interested about, um, first of all, uh, let me just say that it has been an intense isolation uh, that I haven't encountered before. And although it allows me to examine this importance and external aspects of contemplation, beauty and awe, it is um, during these times that as part of a society, we are put on a quest to find um, this tricky word, uh, consolation, and to define what means uh, to have an essential harmony between um, common sense and inspiration. Now, common sense, uh, um, let me just try to focus that idea. Uh, I'm talking about common sense because normally what we would do is just go outside and do a bunch of studies and sketches and then uh, bring those to the, to the studio and working whatever you're working on in this case in my case working on those things um but it is also very important that um to have in mind that at all times sources of inspiration remain remain with us in, and i'm talking about um all master paintings we can also focus on that trying to understand that um, make master copies of it and then even if you just have a chance once in a week or uh, once in two weeks, I don't know. Um, I don't know how difficult it is for uh, everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, for me right now, I'm, um, I'm currently living in Mexico City. Uh, I wasn't born here, so I, ha I haven't seen my family, uh, which I miss. But it's also a little bit tricky to go to the forest and to go to the, the wild nature that I love. So. Um, I have to stick uh, to a specific 
schedule, uh, and this is a mental schedule, not like um, uh, work on one thing and next to the other. No, I, I'm talking about like to be very patient and be very organized with my own discipline and with, with what I want. Uh, that means to get things done. And in, it involves obviously certain methodology, um, a persistent will, and focus on tangible uh, goals. So I understand um, that going through these um, situations um, will give us the hardest challenge, mm -hmm. especially for people who work from life, who love to work from life. It is very difficult and um, you got to do what you got to do. Sometimes it, you just have to create some different um, ways to meditate and to avoid distractions work in something specific so um what that's what i do these um imaginative scenarios it doesn't mean that those are right not at all if anything they could be really bad at describing something uh, physical uh, in nature but that's how you um well at least that's how i meditate thoroughly seeking for this serenity that i'm trying to achieve and to be attentive to everything surrounding my life and others. In this case, uh, I mentioned that I am working um, directly from life with a model, uh, two models actually. So I don't see them all, all, the, all the week. I mean, it's just once or twice a week. And every time I, I create this um, safe environment for them so they feel safe and they can work. And also I'm in, in, at a certain distance that I, it's not very, um, good often. I mean, I'm trying to be further from them, but for a way uh, um, to just make them feel good. Because to me, when I'm working with a model, it's the most important thing just to make them feel good. It doesn't matter about how I feel. I'm just going to be behind my, my evil. But um, without going uh, much further with that, um, I, I think I... I want to say that uh, one of the successes that I can count for me in being under this um, self-isolation is that, uh, that times like these not only consist of moments of solitude, but practically uh, my whole professional life will consist on that because uh, we always are, uh -huh. most of the time, are alone in our studio. So, um, it's great to meditate about that. Um, I think I have been more um, persistent and I have recognized the benefit of this gift that is given to me that I, I can naturally have a place to work in. And I have people to trust in my work and in myself to come here uh, to risk their own health to come to the studio and pose for me. So uh, it is an instantly um, fact that it evokes a callback to experience the nature or how fragile beings we all are. And so I yes. uh, appreciate uh, the observation from direct or indirect uh, nature, which uh, is related to creating some sort of imaginative mm. situation. But well, yeah, um, it, more it's great that, that you have these models accessible. I mean, that, that's really very special. Uh, that yeah. leads me to wonder with Betty, uh, the workshops that you were touching upon, um, are those not happening right now? In other words, is July going to be the first that you think will actually happen this season? Um, yeah, we've had to move a few things to um, online classes and yeah. what works and what doesn't work is really interesting. We had a class it's, I think it's two more to go um, on writing your memoir. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's for people who have uh, deep things that they need to put down on paper. That's worked great. In fact, I think people actually say more during these meetings, online meetings, than they would in the classroom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they share a lot of stuff. It's very interesting. Um, it's harder with studio work. Um, you know, like bark drawing is definitely needs to be a studio mm -hmm. class. So what we did was we uh, converted, we were um, given permission to um, convert some grant money into 
um, an online class and we um, got in touch with Sandra Sanchez who taught a self-portrait drawing class. Now that is really interesting. It actually went really well. Yeah, it went really well. Um, because you have a mirror set up and you have your easel and then you have your camera and then you have this other uh, camera on your artwork. Right. Um, so the, sure. the setup was, it, it's a little bit of adjusting at the very beginning, but it went great because we got new students as well as students who've been with us for a while. So it was a real nice combination class mm -hmm. and, and um, we got some kudos on that one. Our first class is actually at the end of July. It's a yeah. workshop with Dennis Sheehan is plein air outside. Um, so I have my fingers and cro toes crossed on that one. Um, the Katie Engberg workshop at the end of July, I think is, is the one that I think you're thinking of. And right. he's fantastic. Yes. And by that time, I think we should be back in the studio okay. Good, good. So here's a question for all of you, and in particular for Betty, I suppose, uh, given her engagement in workshop scheduling. Uh, do you feel that when all this is over, there will be more interest by various people in some, not all, online offerings. But that, do you think people's eyes have been opened to the efficiency of some kinds of topics being taught online, uh, not just only in person? You mentioned self-portraits, and that's a very interesting um, way to go. What, what do you all think? I mean, I, I personally hope for in-person all the time, but I recognize that, that the online thing has its own benefits. There are lots of people who can't get to you uh, physically anyway because they live in another state, et cetera. Yeah. Any thoughts? Yeah, yeah. For sure. I think that's huge. I'm actually, I think that at least for art is one of the biggest, best things that would come out of this is mm -hmm. just improved accessibility for more people, which is really exciting. I think that kind of, skill-based learning that is uh, easy to access in bigger cities is a lot harder to find outside of those and there's people who are interested I think all over the country but just don't know where to go for that kind of education and so if you don't have to go anywhere then I think there's going to be a big um, upsurge in people who are invested in that kind of learning. Great, good for our field. Yes. I also think that um, what works best online is when the artist is demoing. You don't get too much to see what the other students are doing, which is the value of the studio work is when your ears are always open to what the instructor is saying to other students and you pick up on mm -hmm. that stuff and then you go over mm -hmm. to their easel and see what's going on. You don't get that with online classes, um, whereas the, during the demo, you're actually closer to what the instructor mm -hmm. is showing then even if you were in the classroom because you're standing <laughs> in a group around the instructor, right? So you're actually right there on top of it um, with uh, the camera. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. makes sense. I, uh, I also believe that it's, it's a curious thing um, just to have this accessibility to, to watch an artist uh, or different um, um, aspects of uh, learning and a method in, in art. And uh, it, it, it is a little bit funny for me because uh, almost two weeks ago, I just um, taught my first class on, on, online and it mm -hmm. was something completely new. Um, um, obviously, it, it, was, it has a lot of um, good things about it, like that he just said, like uh, this um, chance for the students to see what the artist is, is working on and at the same time to listen in all the insights and all the the procedures that, that we normally have to take to create an image. But also, um, I think, and I was able to see how happy everybody was, like mm. uh, just um, trying to, oh. to, to go away from uh, these complications to just uh, to, to be in touch with people and at least to, to learn uh, something that they like. Um, this is a very good for, for those situations. Um, also, I can have my doubts about uh, the way people can actually learn from that, because it's not that easy. It, I mean, mm -hmm. when you are looking at a, at a um, screen, you might get everything that you're looking at, um, but that sensibility sometimes gets lost a little mm -hmm. bit. 
because it's not a personal touch. So um, it often makes me think and wonder, okay, so if the, the coming future is gonna be more like this, how can I, what can I do to, to make even people more um, comfortable and also uh, to remain with their eyes open to, to do things not only by um, helping us because it's actually helping us uh, as artists to just to keep producing, mm -hmm. but uh, also for them uh, to keep learning. But the tangibility, uh, I think I have, um, I'm repeating this word because I mentioned it before, but it's, it's that it's very important to, to be in touch with that, to what is truthful, to what it means more than just um, a picture. Yeah. So, um, it's um, it's also interesting because we have as as, um, as the artist who is do, doing the demo, uh, we have to to leave our vague uh, idiosyncrasies sometimes behind because mm -hmm. it, 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 we can get just, <laughs> we can get lost when when we are talking or when we are describing some specific method. Um, which is funny. I mean, I'm not saying that we have to stop doing that. I think, uh, yeah, I encourage actually to everyone else to, to keep doing that. But it's just like, be very focused on what you are telling, what are your thoughts about it, and also um, to just be organized, because this is more than just an activity for me and for uh, all of us that we are present here and a lot of people. This is something like a philosophy. And it's, yes, it's like, an ideal, an idealistic thought, but it's also very specific. And I think it's gonna help a lot of, of these communities to get stronger, if anything, um, at least for the academic communities, which um, are the ones that I'm more involved with. Uh, I think those um, experiences that we have had uh, are making us stronger with our will or like I said um, with our philosophies to work from life for example. So uh, Katie if I can ask you about Grand Central I mean the idea of being one of the leaders in the field I mean it was one of the earliest mm -hmm. of its kind um, in terms of online what's the feeling I mean what, what is the plan obviously we're all beginning to think about the future now and new ways of being normal. Right yeah, it has been a really interesting journey for us that I've kind of, um, even though I have no official role in admin, I've found myself in the middle because it's an all hands on deck situation right now. And um, gosh, our um, administration team has just crushed it in, in this crazy time. We had, you know, it takes three months to plan the summer workshops and our core program is a whole nother, you know, uh, organic organism of its own that has uh, taken on its its lifestyle and the way that it does. So we, it, you know, we had a week to take all this programming and figure out what to do with it, and we moved the core online, and then after the first week of quarantine, where we were trying to figure out what to do, moved the core online. Um, a week later, moved all the part-time classes online, and now we're wow. in the process of moving. Wow. Yeah, it's been, I, I can't even <laughs> tell you. <Yeah. laughs> Wait, shout out to Joy Tomasco, who's okay. basically single-handedly running. a lot, yeah. She has three computers in her apartment right now, and she's just like running <laughs> Zoom oh all day. We call her mission control. <laughs> um, but it's been fascinating because one, the support from our community has been unbelievable. So many um, students, uh, part-time students in our community have donated their tuitions to help teachers' salaries. All this stuff has been incredible. But um, to go back to the point of access that this has Mm -hmm. um, moving things online is created. We have um, participants in the part-time classes from other countries. Wow, and, exciting! And they're, you know, these people are saying, "I followed GCA," and and Cesar would relate to this. Followed for years, and um, it's really hard to get that access if you can't travel to New York. 
especially if you live in another country, it's that's so much expense and time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been really exciting to watch our community grow. It's been really difficult. There's a lot of, um, as, as Cesar was also saying, it's, you know, the, there is the tangibility of, because what we do is actually like a physical thing. Um, so that's, you know, that's a downside, but, um, but it's wonderful to expand. And one of the things, and that we kind of touched on this last week, actually, in our conversation um, with Mario Robinson was talking about the mentorships he started doing. And that is another um, aspect of the core community that we implemented is every student has a mentor during this time. Great. And that's been one of, and I was lucky enough to get a mentor, a mentee, even though <laughs> I'm technically not a teacher, but I, I jumped in there. And um, it's like, I look forward to it every week. It's one of the most fun things. Great. So yeah, I'm really excited about that community building aspect mm -hmm. of taking these small communities, even um, a place like Weathersfield and how they're opening out this big. And I'm so excited that so many people are going to see this and hopefully so mm -hmm. many people are going to enter and mm -hmm. just bring us all together in this difficult time. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Well, so I, I think you all have put your finger on this uh, in, in different ways, that this notion of um, there is opportunity in crisis. Uh, and so the question is, how do we keep some of that good and yet not lose sight of where we started and what we value most? Uh, and from my perspective, the adding of online content in the future, when we can sort of stabilize uh, and figure out the funding model, um, is a great thing. As you say, it serves people far away. Uh, also, maybe they'll come study with you in the summer or all year long if they get so hooked on it. Um, that's all for the good. Uh, and as long as we don't lose that special core um, at the center of the mission, then we're all right. Um, I feel like all of that is being figured out by each individual organization or artist. Um, and, and that is time consuming and stressful. There doesn't seem to be a roadmap for everybody. Uh, and part of that, I'm just going to guess, is that because our ateliers and academies very often live outside the National Association for Schools of Art and Design, because they are not accredited, because they have their own idiosyncratic history and way of doing things, there isn't a set of protocols sent out from headquarters at the beginning of a crisis. I don't mean that the university art departments have it all figured out either. Believe me, they don't. But there are systems in place. Uh, so this is double trouble. You know, you all at Weathersfield and Grand Central have found your way forward all these years, and now you're finding your way forward yet again uh, in these extraordinary times. Uh, and we take our hat off to you. Um, it's it's not easy, but but hopefully some of this is going to accrue as a positive. Um, in the short term, I want to ask about sales for everybody. Um, tell me about how things feel commercially for you. Let's start with Zoe in terms of, you know, whether it's galleries or uh, individual exhibitions, auctions, benefits, um, networks that you're in, like um, Artsy, you know, whatever it might be. How, how are things going economically for you uh, and your colleagues? I'm actually doing okay, which uh, <laughs> is really, I feel incredibly lucky. Um, I'm working with UC Berkeley right now on a project for their uh, environmental resource college mm -hmm. and they have a large revitalization that's going on for that campus and so I'm doing work for that which right. I'm you know really excited about and then I'm also um, I feel like this really ties into some of the stuff we were talking about earlier I'm doing a residency with St. Gaudens National Historical Park which is in Cornish New Hampshire so I'm obviously not there right now so it's a uh, now a remote residency <laughs> and so <laughs> um, we're I'm coordinating with the park officials and uh, various people affiliated with the St. Gaudens Memorial which is funding my residency to figure out how to create content that's sort of taking the place of me being the on-site sculptor there and so it's 
touching on a much smaller scale things that Katie was talking about with GCA. So I'll be teaching right. online classes via their organization. And part of the residency is just having an artist open studio. And so since I won't be there for that, I'll be live streaming just my work in my studio here and discussing that. Um, and then there's some complications with that just because they're a federal organization. And so yeah. there's, yeah, accessibility requirements we need to make. So it's a lot of pre-planning so things can be captioned and um, yeah. it's an interesting process. So I'm learning a lot right now. Well, they're good people. Uh, you're in good hands and I'm sure they're they thrilled are. to be working with you. I really like those folks. They're uh, wonderful. They've been an so inspiration kind. St. Gaudens was. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, they're a really wonderful park. Will you Good. get go do any of it eventually? I, I really hope so. The grounds look so beautiful. Yeah, I, was, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about that because I, <laughs> I was curious. I knew you were supposed to be in, in New Hampshire all summer. Yeah, so I'm hoping that if things are clear enough that I'll be able to do, it's a six month residency, so I'll be able to do the final three months there if that works out but we're sort of just playing it by ear right now and seeing how it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. I hope you can get so, there. Sorry? Uh, I hope you can get there. <laughs> I do too. Yeah, I do too. That would be great. Yeah, just well, to Betty. see his work in person and, yeah. you know, to be able to actually touch on the place would be really, really inspiring. It's a great site. Uh, always worth a visit up there, especially in the summer and the fall. Um, Betty, you mentioned that Katie Engberg is selling well, uh, just one example of an instructor who's doing fine. I hope that's still true even during the pandemic. Um, in general, um, d does the Academy push the works of art of instructors out into the world commercially, or is that their own affair? I, I just want to make sure I understand. H how does that work? Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> 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 Somebody came into the room, so I had to mute myself. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, we do like to hang the works of our instructors on our walls, and we've actually sold paintings off the walls, which is unbelievably fantastic. Um, yeah, and then we do have shows at least twice a year, but this um, we haven't done a competition like this one in mm -hmm. um, three years, so we're really yeah. hoping to move it along. We'd love to get a gallery space. Um, you know, that's yeah. that's in the works. Well, we're we're going to help as best we can at Fine Art Concert okay. to promote your event. It, it's fantastic, and it's Good. coming at just the right Thank time yes. for people yes. to enjoy. Right, uh, Katie. Thank how you. about you? You have an exhibition coming in Los Angeles, right? I do, uh, opening September 5th at Arcadia Contemporary. Um, so hopefully the sales will be good. We'll see, I don't know. Um, yeah, I've been working, I kind of, um, I, I downsized some of the, the works. I was gonna do some larger pieces and I still have some larger pieces, but um, in talking with Steve, the, the gallery owner, um, we decided that maybe, you know, doing a, just some, a few more on a smaller scale would be mm -hmm. a better course of action at this time, yep. which um, it's great for me. I mean, flowers scale down much easier than they scale up. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's a smart entrepreneur, so that's good yes. advice, I'm sure. Right. Yes. Yeah, right. we'll look forward to that show. Now, right. Cesar, I was wondering, uh, you mentioned that uh, one of your largest works ever is underway. You said something like four by six feet. Did I hear yes. you correctly? And, yes. and if so, I mean, that's great because big can be so beautiful. What gives you this confidence, this optimism that that will sell? In other words, I'm not saying it won't, but, but it's a risk for you because it's a lot of time, right? right. To make a large work. Tell me more about that. What, what's happening with you economically, commercially? Well, um, for, fortunately, uh, I'm okay. So um, that allows me to keep working all the time. Uh, I am practically every day uh, of the week in the studio, mm -hmm. working at least from eight to 10 hours. So wow. I'm just trying to be focused um, and to remain conscious with my decisions and also striving for uh, an ideal virtue of my own personal work. And that also um, involves uh, to value the orientation or also the message at the, at the same um, 
as different ways of performing um, shows or exhibitions to, to show my work, uh, which I'm not close to it. I'm just, um, I'm actually very happy to, to do something like that. And um, in terms of um, how, how to sell these, these paintings, um, I think uh, not only with uh, the help of social media and my mm -hmm. web page and also mm -hmm. the, the collectors that I have met before, uh, because they, they all of them are great. They are actually helping me to show my work. Not none. It doesn't mean that they are trying to buy it, but they are trying to help me to just um, to make it to be outside for everyone to see. And that is wonderful because it actually offers me the opportunity to for for my work and better said to to be seen by different and more people than before. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not it's not going to be easy, of course. Uh, if anything, it's going to be one of the hardest things for us because um, most of the times when we sell paintings or drums or sculptures, any kind of discipline that we work in, um, it's through a gallery or through an exhibition. Mm -hmm. Most of the time. Uh, I'm not saying that it's the only one. And I think that small part that we normally don't um, explode, uh, we have to do it right now. And um, you know, one of the things that uh, kept me thinking, um, well, at least at the past two months, uh, kept me thinking the, the same thing. It is that um, us, um, as artists, we have to to engage with that reality thinking that is perhaps going to, to change, and not the thing that it was before, but if it wasn't, now to be more humanistic or to have mm -hmm. a humanity point of view. Mm -hmm. And that is going to change perspective, uh, the perspective of spectators. For good, I, I hope. Yeah. Because um, we are holding on to a strong commitment and to a, probably one of the biggest challenges of our lives. Mm -hmm. But um, it's exactly perhaps what we need to even show others how important ideally and philosophically is to appreciate this kind of work. Yeah. Here, here, absolutely. I, I have to say, I think that's something I'm hearing from more and more people, that the sheer trauma of this experience is reminding of us of our humanity, uh, mm -hmm. and that the art we're already making oh, yeah. is in that zone already, uh, and that it doesn't require any retooling. You just keep doing what you do, uh, whether it's about human beings or nature, um, that's all part of what we're doing. Uh, and that maybe the ones who are going to struggle, perhaps, are the more cutting edge who are disconnected from that through technological media, uh, possibly through um, things that are experiential and yet people can't get to them. Um, it, it's a question mark. I mean, nobody has any answers on this, but I think your optimism is well placed. Yeah, yeah. that's great. I, I thought it was um, really wonderful, but also really interesting to hear the connection between Zoe and Cesar and, and how they both mentioned very early on in their slides that they're exploring these themes of, of human connection with nature. Yes. And then the show at Weathersfield is a sense of place. Yeah. And um, in this time, it seems like a lot of people are kind of going outside to you know, get some relief and, and, yeah. and also creating stuff. Making art is a big, a, a lot of people are kind of living at our solitary artist <laughs> lifestyle right now and, and whether they're making bread or doing watercolor paintings. Um, so it is really interesting to see these things develop. And um, yeah, it feels really special. I've also been thinking a lot about um, Monet's water lilies and mm. how he painted them during um, World War One, yes. which was also mm -hmm. the at the same time as the um, Spanish flu pandemic, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I just I think about that a lot. The the the, the those giant waterly paintings, and when Cesar was talking about his biggest work and yeah. and the optimism there, um, I think there's a real place for that in in the arts um, during times like this. It feels oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, just, I think that the, you, you can't, I mean, that not to make a blanket statement, but to have pieces that are like 
particularly large or shock and awe or, or jarring, which I think a lot of contemporary art could lean towards, is really, I don't think people have the emotional capacity right now to, to process. And so I think having pieces like Monet's Water Lilies are the things that remind us of the better parts, like what Cesar was saying, of humanity, of um, nature, of belonging, of beauty, like to say like higher moral, I don't know if higher moral values is the way you could put it, but. Um, well, it's a higher plane anyway. Yeah. Um, it's not so uh, Christian, uh, not, not at all. Yeah. Yeah. Betty? I, I, I think it's also um, in a quarantine situation, you're able to examine things deeper and closer. Like for instance, Katie, that flower behind you, the Torah, the, the I think one, two, three, four, five, six, I see six of them over there, right? Yeah. <laughs> I first came across that in Machu Picchu and uh, I later discovered that they're poisonous. Yeah. <laughs> Humans, very poisonous. And, and I've, you know, and I've come across this when I see this, like I kind of like chop it down because I have a dog that eats everything. So, <laughs> I mean, there's a wild version of it around here that's native, I guess. Um, but it, I just, I just love that you, you know, did it these little things. But in, and when you and you focus in on the details of these things, you examine them closely, and you see some amazing things. And um, I have to. Have you ever? Do you have a series, Night Blooming Cactus? No, I don't. Oh. I okay. I'm going to send it to you because this flower. <laughs> blooms once a year at night and it's only open for three hours and it dies it's unbelievable it, the, the fragrance just fills the room no pressure yeah. katie <laughs> <laughs> sounds great send it to me i love it <laughs> yeah um, oh that's an offer how about that yeah, it's, I'll, I'll send it to you <laughs> hey, hey. Love it. yeah I'm, I'm shocked to realize that we are actually up for our hour so i mean we, we could go on all day but we don't want to keep folks online forever um, I think, just if I may, to offer a few um, additional rays of sunshine uh, to our listeners, uh, basically uh, Streamline Publishing, which publishes Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine and also the weekly e-newsletter of Fine Art Today, is offering extra uh, features during the pandemic just to keep people stimulated. Uh, every day at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, there is a three-hour segment offered for free. Uh, from one of our Streamline Art video programs. These are demos, uh, often running to seven hours in total. Uh, we give a three-hour uh, snippet. Uh, that's all available on Facebook if you search Streamline Art Video. That's all there every day. Uh, we're also giving away an amazing little landscape painting by Joseph McGurl, uh, the oh. famous uh, painter. Uh, nice. If you go to paintinggiveaway.com and register, uh, you'll find out more about uh, your chances there. Um, also, uh, we are... No planning. We're, we're going forward with the Figurative Art Convention and Expo. Uh, that mm -hmm. will occur in Baltimore, Maryland, October 29 through November 1st. Uh, that's a gathering of about 400 people uh, watching demos by master artists. Uh, we're blowing it out, uh, not only figurative, but also a few landscape, a few um, still life, uh, a few uh, sculpture uh, demonstrations as well. So that will be uh, really fun. Uh, it's a real jamboree. Uh, and finally, uh, every Friday we have our virtual art gallery walk where we uh, essentially present highlights of gallery uh, activity uh, going on around the country. So we're, we're believers in galleries. We want them to succeed because they are an important piece of our ecosystem. No matter how online we go with social media and artsy and so on, we also want to see bricks and mortar galleries survive. Um, that's what I've got in the way of specifics. If anyone wants to chime in with another website or link, um, we can hear from you now. Okay. Um, yes. Just no, shortly, please. I was going to cite St. Gaudens again. They'll, I'll be teaching classes via their website. There's a link that will be coming soon to sign up for those, and we'll be also live streaming sculpting. Great. Excellent. That's good. And of course, please visit Grand Central uh, website, visit Weathersfield's website. Um, all very worthy, definitely. And all of the artists here uh, the slides carry your uh, web address. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, all I can say is thank you for your time. You've been great sports thank on you. this. I know we'd thank rather be you. together in person drinking cocktails, but it's great that we can share this from Mexico to California to Connecticut yeah. to New York. Kind of cool. That's yeah, it is. Yeah, it's very, very cool. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you so you much all. for having us. Of yes, course. Thank you. Stay safe. All right.
All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Gail, you're in charge. We're turning it over to you. <laughs> I think we can sign off now. All right. Everybody, you can leave. Thank you.